do it. Yeah. Welcome, welcome everyone to what I know is going to be a really fascinating conversation for you, you who are watching, you who are listening, which is why Steve and I are here. We're not really here for any other reason. We're here because we want to give you stuff that's given us aha moments over the years and continue to. So here we are. So Steve, do you want to say a little bit about, well, anything, go for it. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for having me on, Jane. And um, yeah, just for the purpose of th th those that don't know us, um, we connected a few years ago, didn't we? We met up for a coffee and we were just discussing that before um, this uh, this recording and saying how long ago it was that we first met. It was about five years ago, roughly about that now, isn't it? About mm -hmm. five years ago, a coffee shop. And we're both in the same kind of line of work. So um, I'm a mental health, workplace wellbeing and suicide first aid trainer. And my experience in the world of this came about eight years ago when I experienced a mental health breakdown at work. And sadly, there were no mental health first aiders, no people to talk about my deteriorated mental health feelings or emotions or even thoughts of suicide and I visited my GP and she signed me off with work-related stress because even just eight years ago the understanding and education around mental health was still really limited mm. so she did what she does with most people what most doctors do for people when they come in experiencing burnout sign them off with work-related stress um so I was off for a month and on my return, I was invited into a meeting. And the result of that meeting was being placed on something called a performance improvement plan. Way. So it was put down to performance rather than how do we support this being who's been very sick, like a month or sick is, is long term sick. Mm. How do we what plan do we put in place? How do we support them? What do they need? It was about oh, that's just you just blown my mind. Do you know that that's fairly common though, Jane? It's because sadly the conditions for honesty are just not there. So what do we do? People in my condition or, or, or position, they'll go to their managers and say it is burnout, work related to stress. And because the conditions for honesty aren't always there, so we can't always say, well, it's mental health related, because we know there's the fear of um your employment being terminated, discrimination, yeah. what peers, friends, family would say. So we we we're just not honest. So we go with the narrative of it's work related. Mm. So in hindsight, it was actually the right thing for them to do, looking back. But believe me, at the time, I had a few choice swear words to say about that. Um, but the, it was the right thing for them to do because they were acting on what they knew, which was... That's a very interesting yeah. perspective already that you're giving me. I have not thought of it that way. Mm, yeah, most people. That's why they get placed on performance improvement plans, because they can't tell the organisation, actually, it's mental health related. Mm because of those fears so that's exactly what they did and again you know in hindsight right thing to do however the irony now is I now go back and educate those yes yes it's the like work them. that you do isn't it yeah absolutely it's such a massive um I don't like the word motivation but purpose purpose and intentionality to your work is that I was that person and I mean I remember myself once of being off for actually in two different jobs one job I was off for about three months with severe anxiety and honestly if you knew the background to what was going on in my life at that time not too surprising um and another time I think about a month and both experiences <laughs> one in particular I had my manager come to my house fairly regularly and say things like so can literally in this tone of voice so can you explain to me Jane really is anxiety then what you what you know like as in get your shit together woman um mm -hmm. and the other one it was so unspoken it was a domestic violence organization I worked for doing amazing work but the badge of honor there was that you work much longer hours you put yourself through the most horrific traumas and you wore it as a badge of honor so nobody said 
if they'd been off sick, long term sick, which people were just as a revolving door. Oh, I've been off long term sick, or I've been off, you know, like for four weeks with ang- with severe anxiety. But I thought, you know what, I'm just going to flip and say it. And I don't think anybody ever discussed it with me. It was like silence. Mm. But I was at that stage in my life where I was like, oh no, I'm going to own it. So. Mm. And that's a thank you for sharing it. That's a really hard thing for people to do mm. to own it because we, you know, for for many of us, we've never been taught how to own it. We've, you know, no, we've yeah. been taught that we've been conditioned from a very young age, especially males, not to talk, oh, yes. not to show our emotions. And sadly, that's what a lot of us do. We don't express our emotions because we can't. We simply don't know how. So going back to the story of the employers, within a month of being back my employment was actually terminated because <gasps> yeah because I couldn't keep up with all the KPIs the pressure that they were putting on me and they said well if you don't hit these figures then I'm sorry then we've got to manage you out again it was the right thing for them to do uh, because they had to protect the business I couldn't tell them and there's this age-old saying isn't there that you can take a horse to water but you can't make it drink no. and I'm sure that looking back in reflection they were trying to help but they didn't know how to because I couldn't express what I needed so it was a real catch-22 there Mm -hmm. um but you can't see at the time and many people don't so what happens then is they'll take the organizations to a tribunal there's this big hoo-ha and fight either way Mm. um and the person that's struggling with their mental health then says well it was the organization that did this yeah it's not solely their responsibility it's the individual too so for me I'm glad you said that because I I it's very interesting I used to do a lot of training like face-to-face training probably like you did all around the country and sometimes I would talk about our responsibility to tend to our own stuff and it often didn't go down very well everybody I I mean I understand the desire for systems to change for organizations to change completely on board with that a million percent but the reality is is if they do at all and I have many clients who have gone through very similar experiences to you lost their jobs um it's like waiting for dinosaurs to you know run a marathon (laughs) um Mm. meanwhile personally I've always preferred to go do you know what 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 can I do because I don't want to feel like this if I wait and I rail against the system I have a right to but actually it's probably going to make me more sick and what can I do myself but I've again sometimes felt a bit like nervous about saying that out loud because people sometimes find that um a bit challenging yeah, for sure. Absolutely. But organisations on the flip side of that love yeah. it because they're going, oh, well, we're doing our part. So yeah. like yourself, when I deliver training, I say to both parties, look, you know, it's wonderful that the organisation are investing in you yeah. to have this training. That tells me a lot about the organisation. Yeah. But also you've got to play your part, which is the organisation can only do so much. And if you aren't willing to help yourself, the organisation can say, well, we've done as much as we can. That's when you need to have the conversation around performance management. But until then, it needs to be person-centred. We need to focus on the individual. What is it that we can help them with? And this is the need. Here's the need That's so for, for my work in organisations, which is let's give them the opportunity and the conditions to mm. be able to speak. Then if they they don't act on that then the organization can say well look we've done as much as we can perhaps you need to be doing more or you need to look at what you're doing for yourself so it's it is swings and roundabouts it's not just about bashing organizations like you say they want to do as much as they can for people I would say some not all I I definitely know some organizations they just blame the individual and they boot them out the door I'm familiar (laughs) with that that process as I say from uh, work I do with people yeah, absolutely. So within a month of being back, um, I then my employment was terminated. And it was at that point that I just didn't want to live anymore. So thoughts of suicide. Yeah, started so that that on more. top of other stuff. Yeah. It's such a devastating impact on your system. And we know it's never that one thing. All, you know, you and I know, you know, we're educating ourselves all the time about childhood trauma. But it's mm. that event on top of that then is is the thing wow 
Absolutely. So that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm. And you're right. This is with suicide. It's never the result of a single event or factor. There's multiple factors. One being male, two being of a certain age, um, coming from a very traumatic upbringing, Mm. death of a sibling at a very young age, drug addiction and losing, you know, losing all of my friends and family and becoming homeless all of this compounded and it was just that one last event so you know we hear this and we see it in the media that oh that person you know we wouldn't have thought that there there was no sign (laughs) out of nowhere Mm. and yeah what they don't understand or see is that it like say it never event is the single event factor and this has been happening for a long time Mm. so they're generally especially with the suicide as well that there are almost always signs i won't say always mm. because quite simply that's given false hope yeah but there are almost always and i think that's the important thing isn't it to offer hope here knowing that you know that it could be prevented if people were to be more aware of the signs so that was an option for me and mm-hmm. in fact i took that option multiple times uh back eight years ago uh next month and i knew then after the third attempt that i needed professional help so after 25 years of not being able to reach for help it was at that point mm-hmm. that i said on the very final attempt if i survive this i'll go back to really? the gp really? and ask for help yeah wow. So it's thank you so much for sharing that because I that's just given me so many light bulb moments um I was suicidal for so long so long it for me it was always in my back pocket from the age of 11 actually it was always in my back pocket um there were times when I attempted even as a child Um, But the one thing I never, ever, ever, ever did, ever, was tell anybody. And obviously no one ever saw any signs. No one. So I I was thinking about that a lot because I I was guessing that we probably, this would be part of our conversation today. Mm. And I was thinking, so nobody spotted in that child, as I was, forward to really not that many years ago that it was that the times when I was either trying or seriously seriously very seriously fighting every day not to do it mm-hmm. um nobody it, it couldn't have been clear in any way obvious I never talked about it it's probably the mm-hmm. first time I have ever talked about it actually um so yeah so that makes me wonder about signs like Mm-hmm. you know what what would be your insights on that because I know this is your field of expertise it's definitely not mine apart from personally <laughs> thank you and again thank you so much for sharing Jane that it's you know it's it can be quite scary to talk about you know to people that don't understand it mm. people like yourself and I that do understand it it's you know we've got a different level of understanding with this especially mm. from lived experience so some of the signs that could be present are things like isolating, um, not telling anyone. So you've gone from being the life and soul of the party or being social to starting to isolate. It might be that you're starting to give possessions away or give cryptic messages, especially on social media. I see this quite a lot with people. Oh, really? How they use it. Yeah, uh, d- darker messages saying things like there's no hope or putting up memes that, you know, we might just look at and go, oh, that that's a bit odd. That's but it's interesting. Smallest. Yeah, absolutely. So it's as times are changing, it's noticing these signs. So it could be um, even uh, uh, making amends, putting all their possessions on Facebook Marketplace. Now, I've realised I've done that recently. Oh, <laughs> yeah, FYI. You're going to say what's going on, Steve? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm moving to Thailand, but we'll come on to that very shortly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it could be, you know, giving possessions away, telling people that, you know, that they might not 
uh, there's there's no hope. They're they're very pessimistic. There's no hope about the future. Again, isolating. Um, it could be wearing inappropriate clothing, hanging around dangerous places. It could be that their self care is just diminished. It's the smallest of things that are out of character for that person. That are out of the norm. So I'd say we kind of really need to know that person. Uh, unless they're in crisis point and let's say that you know that they're on a bridge or somewhere that's evident um but it is really paying attention to the small behavior changes within the person yeah, not rationalizing them because we because we we become such a rational species which is why everyone is sick um mm. that it's you know and I, again i would never want anyone who has lost someone to suicide um i i have my brother died from suicide to ever feel as I know, as I know the people present in their lives, and um, because he 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 uh, lives in Australia, so I was not present in his lives. But I know my amazing sister and his amazing wife; they were very present in his lives. And he, which I understand, and again, we'll hand, hand this to you because I know this is much more your field of expertise. But my understanding is that men often actually is there are not so many signs he mm. he had been in a psychiatric hospital he was released the psychiatric hospital did not tell anyone first 48 hours do not let him out of your sight that is the window mm. they didn't tell my sister they didn't tell my um, sister-in-law and he just manufactured away and went off and you know died um so and my understanding is that that more so with men, there's often less signs. Um, uh, tragically, a young person in a village near here I know has just died from suicide. Um, a young male, 32, same age as my son and my daughter-in-law. Um, I suspect he didn't. He just, you know, that's been what I've seen over the years and years and years and years of being working with people who've lost people to suicide and my own experiences men it's often more secret is that the right word I don't know hard to spot mm -hmm. yeah and Jane I'm so sorry to hear about your brother and you know you are right with men Tim. I should name things. him Tim <laughs> sorry Tim. To hear no no Tim. I didn't name him Tim my brother a very literally someone who saved my life actually mine and my son's life so beyond incredible human being gosh and, you know, you are right with this. Um, men tend to be more impulsive. Um, you know, they, um, they, they do use more lethal means. So when we look at things like, you know, the, the cause of death, I won't go into details here. Mm. But men use uh, lethal means. So if we yeah. consider the where the highest death rates are to suicide within the United Kingdom and Ireland, it's in the construction industry. Yes, um, access to lethal means male dominated you know it pays very well a lot of them are away from home they're away from their families they act on you know using unhelpful coping strategies drink and drugs whilst yeah, they're yeah. well and, and you're definitely not going to talk about feelings if you're part of the <laughs> i would say you know that's a generalization but funnily enough that's when my brother began his career in the construction industry and he was the most sensitive being i've ever met actually but had to do the man stuff <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so it, it's almost like it's seen as a weakness to express yeah. our feelings and emotions um, but you, as you know, and I know th th through the hard way of learning this, mm. it's probably the best thing that we can do to express mm. our feelings and emotions. If there's um, someone safe, though, that that's another yeah. thing. So I know I keep yeah. over, but you you just give me so many like, aha, aha. Because yeah. <laughs> um, again, I see this on social media all the time. It's like talk to somebody, talk. But you have to find someone, and this is this is hard. I mean, none of us are going to do this perfectly. If someone comes to us and says do you know what? I just, I just feel like crap. There's days when I'm driving to work, I just feel like driving into a wall. Now, unless you've got some background in this, and I know this is the amazing work that you do to coach people into, you know, if you are that person, how you can do this. Um, but most people would just go into a very logical, you know, something because we, ha we're not 
very great at being an emotional holding space unless you've done lots of work on yourself and then you know it becomes it comes naturally um mm. but it's it's so hard you know even me now with all the work I've done on myself I have probably I know in fact I don't probably I know I have two people in the world that if I'm really going to say how I feel about someone as uh, not someone but something they are my safe people mm. And they don't have any training, actually. They just are my safe people. They can emotionally hear me, not try and fix me. Mm. So it's, it's it's interesting, isn't it? To Sometimes I think people try and then the poor person on the receiving end, mm. um, of course, unintentionally drops the ball, which, again, mm. goes back to the, the amazing work that you do. Are you right with that? It's We try to intellectualise it as mm. opposed to feel it which is okay how can I logic my way out of this yeah well, I need to do step one two three four um otherwise oh I don't know phone the police call them panic yeah. yeah and the thing with this is you're right when you said about men they need to be able to express their feelings and emotions if they're safe so there's this narrative currently that I'm going to challenge which is men don't talk which is absolute horseshit. Right. Right. Men do talk if the conditions are right. If they yeah. feel safe, if they're met with the conditions, right person safe, yeah. they'll talk. Um, you know, do, uh, well, as you know, I do, I do now, and I'm happy to talk about my feelings yeah. and emotions because which I know what's it. on the other side of this. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't come easily. What you know, the way that you have evolved over the time that I've known you, it's. It takes a lot of hard work, particularly for our men, to be able to do what now na naturally comes to you. Um, I do, you know, in my coaching practice, I do have men I work with and um, they get they do get to that point. But it's it's much harder because we we raise boys and girls very differently. You know, my one of my joys in life is looking at the way we raise children and then joining up all the dots and. It, I mean, just I was with my granddaughter yesterday, two and a half. She's on the beach. We're ch chatting with a woman who's got lovely dogs because she loves dogs. So she's hugging the dogs and stroking the dogs. And, you know, we have this lovely exchange. And then the woman turns to her and says, oh, you're such a pretty girl, aren't you? Yeah. Like, wow. That's all you can say about this unbelievably amazing being mm. because we're conditioned. That, and I said I was saying to my daughter-in-law after us, if you know, Olivia was a boy, then she'd be saying, oh, you're so clever, you're so strong, you're so... And it and it starts all back there. Mm -hmm. Shut the men down, tell them they're strong, tell them they're this. The girls, it, you know, as we know, it's definitely not great for girls either, but mm -hmm. it's a different, it's a very different journey, very different. So to become a man through the hard work that you do in yourself, where you actually can say, do you know what? Just, I've spent half the morning flipping crying. Mm. you know what a gift to other men oh actually he seems to be doing okay that guy and you know whatever but actually he can oh flip because I thought I was you know losing it because actually I cried on the way to work today mm. yeah yeah absolutely and it, it's being that beacon of hope for others as well isn't it like you say you know being in a group of uh, other men and comfortably saying look no I'm not feeling great today my mental health form score isn't great this is what's happened one, I don't think everybody's ready to receive that kind of information. You know, when we do our formalities of saying hello, we'll generally yeah. say, hey, how are you? I'm and good. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> don't say anything more. And I, I just no, remember... no, no. Well, they'll say things like, I'm tired. I'm like, yes. You know, when I train professionals, this yeah. always slightly alarms me, I have to say. So, you know, I nowadays I, I train uh, groups of professionals for the Healing Together program for Innovating Minds, who I work for. And um, these are all professionals who are there to have a two days training on childhood trauma and how to be with children who have trauma and all the rest of it. And, you know, if you but I've been doing this for years in groups of hundreds of people at conferences saying, OK, so how's everyone feeling today? And what you get back is I am tired. I'm I didn't get, you know, much breakfast. This what you don't get back is their emotions. Yes. Yes. Nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, they've been conditioned to believe that a feeling is, oh, there's only two or three feelings. Well, happy or sad. That's yeah. it. I've just gone into this recently, actually, with my therapist. And she said, OK, you're telling me a lot about 
intellectualizing this but how are you <laughs> feeling no it's really interesting when you sent me uh, some information through jane and said how do you feel about this she yeah felt good about that and that was the difference knowing First question we ask yeah always and I'm, I'm with my granddaughter every time every time you know she might say boo my pencil pencil's broken and the first thing I try and um, as with every fiber of my being to say not say oh let's find you in is to say wow Olivia how does that feel that your pencil is broken mm-hmm. you know if we if we're hugging a tree we're wondering how the tree is feeling I wonder how the dog was feeling literally I will go to my grave if I do nothing else mm-hmm. with in you know offering this child the ability to go actually how am I feeling good flipping question and it becomes natural absolutely and again comes down to conditioning if you've never been taught that people will just respond with okay all right and I just remember um my ex-fiance when she came to England she's Hungarian and people were asking her how are you how how are you today how are you and she'd go into one absolutely tell them everything (laughs) And she said, people in England wouldn't yeah, they listen. Want to know. They, didn't, they, they didn't want to know, but they've just asked me, how are you? Yeah. She said, I find you very odd. And I said, yeah, it's a formality in England. It's like, hey, don't want to know. Hello, bye. Yeah, please don't give me the, yeah, give yeah. me the, yeah, that's so Don't give me all that, yeah. And I can and think- sometimes people feel really uncomfortable. And I don't, I never do it for that reason. But, you know, when I say to people, oh, how are you feeling? You can feel the, like, whoa, left you know I wasn't expecting that question (laughs) yeah 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 absolutely and I think you know with a lot of this and the learning of this I think a lot of it that what we see and learn as well from social media and around you know the the whole positivity movement and toxic (laughs) positivity and I know that we've spoken about this before and you see it online and Mm. you know it's just everywhere yeah gosh what are you grateful uh, for like whoa (laughs) Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think all of that has got its place. And but to me, I do see a lot of it. And when I see this stuff online, I think you're talking horseshit. Um, And I think maybe that might be from my perspective and my view of struggle to get to the place where we are now. So my view of the world and my window of the world is, you know, I've got slight bias with that because I've gone through struggle like yourself. But when I see it from people that have never, ever struggled and they're saying all of this shit and I think, mm. honestly, you can nobody else see through this? Is it just well, me? Do you know what? Thank you. I, I knew we should have this because I, I have been on a bit of a mission recently where I've been like, do you know, I'm going to buy some of these um, best selling self-help books on mm. being happy and positive and all that crap. Because, like, what the hell? How are these million-seller books? Because we know, like, people who know, you know it's not going to make no difference. Mm -hmm. Um, Follow this system and you will... No, you won't. Um, So I've been on this, like, research mission of reading these books. I'm just like, well, it's the same stuff recycled, but particularly if it's by a doctor, somebody, or, a you know, anyone with a... Whatever. Um, And I just read them and exactly what you said. I'm like, but this is just the same... Why... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do people, and I guess it's because it is familiar. It doesn't feel uncomfortable. It's like, oh, I just need to wake up in the morning and meditate for five minutes and keep saying I am blah, 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 blah. And then I'll be fine because this person who's very, very rich from doing it is saying it. And it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, oh, it's always like, what's that story? The, the emperor's clothes, is it? Or the, uh, you know, where they're like the the story is the emperor's actually got nothing on and everyone's going oh they look amazing oh wonderful emperor and it's like a child calls them out and says but you've got no clothes on I think we might be those children you and me Steve <laughs> I think we are and th- th- there's such a good point with this stuff because I remember my journey into the world of self-development personal mm. development and I'm not against it. I'm a huge fan of it done well. So when I went into the world of self-development, personal development five years ago, I just remember seeing all this stuff online from people generally living in Bali, um, <laughs> the Bali billionaires, I like to call them. And they're saying, life is amazing. Just be full of gratitude, mindset. There's another one. Oh. Bring your mindset. It's and Change your mindset, really. It's change your mindset, easy. change your life. See me. Yeah. And because I was in this place of suffering and vulnerability, 
I wanted, I bought into it. I bought into it. And thought, you know what? What I ultimately want is a better life and to be happy. So what they're doing is very clever marketing. Lots of NLP, lots of... Oh, yes. Yeah, lots of games just Mm -hmm. to play with your mind, to trick you into thinking. If you invest in this, ultimately, people only want a few things, which is to be happy, status, money, and, you know, just a few basics. Mm -hmm. So they buy into this, but these people know this. So it's very clever marketing. Yeah. And people that are vulnerable, hugely vulnerable, really struggling, want this life, and they they simplify it. They say, all you have to do... Oh, you need meditation. To yeah, be positive all the time. But it's Sit killing down me. for three hours and meditate, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's just, I mean, it probably does sound like I am knocking things like meditation, but it's because I I also know that if you have any level of trauma, the worst, the worst experience can be because when we have trauma we move we're busy we we and we you know our system is doing that to protect us from actually connecting with mm. whatever we feel on the inside so when i see things bloody mindfulness and all that stuff i'm very i'm like okay but let's just make sure that people know that being still and being quiet mm-hmm. can be the worst experience you're ever going to have particularly if you're doing it on your own Mm-hmm. because suddenly all the has stopped and now whatever you've been your system's cleverly been saving you from feeling you're going to mm-hmm. feel it and it's going to not be good and you know especially doing it to children I'm very opposed to that just all oh, close your yeah. eyes and because it's actually very dangerous potentially um, but if people are finding these things useful then you know I always say well if it's working and you feel calmer and safer when you've done it then do do the thing please please yeah. um but yeah. just know from a trauma perspective that yeah stillness and solitude and tuning into yourself um can can feel horrendous so you because this is my big thing about the self help self help industry is it relies on you the individual doing the thing yeah. And then it very cleverly makes you feel um, so if you know being very positive and being all this stuff hasn't worked for you, then hmm, what's wrong with you? You need my next book, you need my next program, you need my whereas in reality, the stuff that's being shared, it can give you really good insights and aha moments, but it can't it can't make you happy. It can't because we're not we're all emotions. We're not meant to be happy. It's not a destination. Um and then, and then, of course, people, because I have so many people I've worked with over the years who have bought program after it, and it becomes an addiction. That's a really tragic thing I've seen as well. Mm. And they don't feel any better. They often end up with me because they've been, and they feel like, but I did that. And I worked with this famous person and it cost me three and a half thousand pounds. And I did the whole program. And at the time is the phrase I always hear, mm. you know, I did or I did the meditation, I did whatever, and I did I did feel better. But you know what, a year down the line, I've still got severe anxiety, or I still um, think I'm the worst piece of crap in the whole universe, despite all my achievements. So that's, that's where I, it really hurts my heart. When I see exactly what you said, Steve, people investing time, money, their emotions, their mm. desires into stuff that can't ultimately give them what they wish to have and then of course they get to blame themselves and and it's sold that way isn't it it's sold that way that it's a quick fix but they don't tell the person investing in this that it's only a temporary solution it's like medication yeah when a gp offers you know the patient medication i think they're getting more wise to it now and they're saying listen this isn't the solution Mm. this is a sticking plant this is a helpful coping strategy Mm. But what I think people don't understand with this, all the self-help and personal development stuff is that's all it is. So going back to what you were saying about the meditation, and I'm I'm with you in total agreement with this, is telling a person that this could bring up traumatic memories of past experiences and actually sitting in your mind, it might be a really dark place. Now, that kind of shit doesn't sell, does it? So that's why they no. don't... <laughs> No one's um, going to do a big be careful before you do this thing. 
Yeah. So very few are trauma informed. Yeah. So what they're actually doing is making things work. And they'll say they'll come to you and people like you and me and say, I tried this, invested these thousands. But we know all it's done is raise their oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin levels, made them feel good temporarily for yeah. now. But the trauma, it's never addressed. So no. it's always there. So what are they doing? Becoming addicted to the feeling. So they invest more and more and more in hope that one day all of this will change. And this is why I say to people when I deliver courses that CBT counselling, coaching, those kind of therapies, remember there's still going to be something underneath it all. So what I would say is have a look at different styles of um, therapies, including trauma therapy or a trauma-informed coach that goes back in to the subconscious mind much like the work that you do and actually working through the trauma in a safe environment because without that trauma being dealt with you can have all the coping strategies in the world yeah it, it, won't, it won't matter it won't matter yeah. I just yeah. have to give a nod to um, Alfie, the black Labrador who lives next door, who's joining sure. us today. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit warm in the UK, so I've got my back door open and Alfie's, uh, he's, he's on guard, bless his little heart. Oh, but no, it's true. It's, it's, I, I often put posts out saying, you know, if you're going to work with anyone, I mean, I used to train therapists and counsellors years ago because they, they're not trained in being trauma sensitive, being trauma attuned, that, you know, it's, it's, I was gonna say it's not their fault. I don't really know how I feel about that. But anyway, they're, they're not, they're not, mm. it's not part of their training. Um, mm. the, for me, unless you can feel in your body, how mm. the person you're feeling with, you're, you're working with is feeling. So whether they are in, you know, I can feel that someone's shifted, particularly into fight flight, whether I can see it on their face, I can tell, I can literally feel my body shift with them. Mm. If they have started to shut down and zone out. And again, these are not choices. This is just your nervous system choosing, as you and I know. Mm. If they started to drop out, boy, oh boy, can I feel like, because it's like falling slowly down a lift shaft. So mm. having the capacity to be able to bring their, their nervous system, especially their autonomic nervous system, back into safety that to me has just got to be a foundation. Otherwise you cannot, you know, if you start poking about in people's stuff and you, whether you're a therapist, a coach, whatever you're, you're putting yourself out there as, and you can't feel it and sense it, yeah. then you're not safe. You're not safe. And I think that's such a danger within the coaching industry because mm. it being so unregulated that mm. people are putting themselves out as mindset coaches, mental mm. health coaches with very little experience. Even now to this day, I've had eight years plus all my life experience within this industry. I don't even go anywhere near that stuff. I don't say I'm a professional. I don't say that I'm a therapist. I say this. I'm an educator with lived experience. That's it. That's my limitation. Just because I know if people come to me and I start talking about mental health and what worked for me, it's subjective. It won't yeah. work for everyone else. No. But these people that go into, and again, with you know the uh, unethical use of NLP and strategies, um, and it's actually making people worse. Yeah. It's actually bringing people to our door going, well, I have this mindset coach. Yeah. What did your mindset coach do? Triggered the hell out of you. And then what? Well, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> was still yeah, with all very common. People, people arrive, end up with me somehow. Usually someone recommends me to them, which is the most beautiful thing. Mm. Because somebody ripped the goddamn Band-Aid off mm. and they didn't that was it and they in no way was had there ever been any healing it had just been held together with some band-aids which you know I always say when people first come to work with me they're like oh but I'm doing this I, we should get rid of this we should clear this out of my subconscious mind we should stop me doing this I'm like whoa 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 and breathe mm -hmm. so if at the moment vaping or whatever it is 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 holding you together then we are not, let's just, let's start, let's start. Let's start at the foundation and what mm -hmm. feels right for you. And then, you know, eventually that stuff may just literally not, not have such an urge. But if at the moment you need to eat a bar of chocolate every night to 
you know, to soothe your emotional state, which is what we're all doing, self-medicating with loads of stuff, or mm -hmm. you need to go on a 10 mile run every day, um, but your body's breaking down, then let's just honor that for now. <laughs> and we will get to that when we get to it. The, the worst thing to do is remove, I always think, I, I remember going to Hong Kong and in Hong Kong, the buildings are held up by um, bamboo scaffolding, mm. which just blew my mind. I'm like, that's just bamboo. But then you think, well, that's <laughs> really very strong then, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not going to start removing their bamboo scaffolding. No, no, no. no. Oh, no. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Let's, let's just start very gently and very slowly with your autonomic nervous system and then move forwards. Um, and, and be guided intuitively by what comes up because because literally you don't know you don't know uh, and the hardest thing jane is knowing that that should be your baseline which is we should be operating in the uh, autonomic uh, uh, nervous system mm. so not in you know the fight flight freeze response mm. the sympathetic nervous system but almost everyone i know is i know I know Almost everyone and the children that's the thing is you know I often say to people here's the thing all right very rarely are we meant to feel like this mm. human <laughs> systems are designed for very occasionally a bear to jump out like really rarely mm. and then you go <gasps> and you you are if you're going to fight a bear good luck you run up a tree you run away or you freeze and you drop to the ground as if you're dead, like a possum would do, playing possum, or yeah, a mouse yeah. in a cat's mouth. Our systems are meant to do that like super rarely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but most people's systems, every single day, every, you know, open the drawer, there's a bear. Open the door, there's a bear. <laughs> Get in the car, there's a bear. Think about anything, is another bear, a bear, a bear, and they're all jumping out at you. And our systems, it's like driving your car 50 miles an hour every day stuck in second gear that's where most people in humanity are hence the yeah. big physical illnesses and mental illnesses of our time mm -hmm. because we're not designed for exactly what you say it's meant to be whoa a bear about a 45 minute cycle that everything settles again and then but what do we do? We have the bear. We tell everyone about the bear. Oh, my God, this happened. Oh, it was terrible. I felt or we put it all over social media or we tell no one. Those are the two options, it seems, these days. And yeah. both are really toxic for our mm. mental health. And then we we read as that, oh, I must I must write a gratitude list tonight. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is not going to help, trust me. <laughs> a bit of meditation at work, a bit of massage. That's what oh. gets next is the investment for mm -hmm. workplace wellbeing strategies, solutions, more sticking plasters. Mm -hmm. So people are going, give their mindfulness, you know, they'll give their yeah. massages. And organisations are going, yeah, this should do it. Well, hang on a minute. You're part of the cause as why they're in fight, flight or freeze yeah. to begin with, because they're in a toxic environment. Yeah. So it's, you know, what's the saying about putting a plant, removing a plant? If the plant doesn't grow, we don't remove I can't remember the whole of the yeah, saying. Yeah, you have to change the environment. That's it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, if, if a plant isn't thriving, then yes. you don't have a long conversation with the plant and intellectualise why it's not thriving. That's it. Why aren't you growing? Uh, <laughs> it's not, you know, maybe I'm watering it too much. Maybe there's not enough light. Let me change the environment. And again, mm. you know, as a lot of my work, although I don't work directly with children anymore, I work with parents a lot. Many of my clients are parents. And we've created this world where everyone's going, well, what is wrong with this child? And it's like mm. the child can only thrive based on the environment, which is you, mm -hmm. you. And if your inner system is not easily able to come back to calmness and groundedness and feeling safe, then the child's system cannot thrive. Mm. And again, you know, people sometimes they'll say to me, oh, Jane, you're, you're, I can't remember, I get called all sorts of things. Not, not for a while, actually, but, you know, you're parent blaming, that's it. You're this, you're that. <laughs> you may say that, but you know, when you know the science and you've, mm -hmm. You know, I've worked with children for so many years of my life and I've seen it again and again and again and again, then it's it's irrefutable. 
It's mm. not, you know, like as a parent, I own everything I did that was amazing. And I did, and I own everything I did that now I realize 32 year, years later was not going to nurture that beautiful plant. Um, and I wish I'd known this and I would have done this work back then if I'd known to do it. So mm. for me, it's like, feel how you feel about it. Get over your feelings and your guilt and your shame and do your work, especially if you have children. Hey. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's such a good point. I think we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. I put a post out about this, you know, deal with your traumas so your children <laughs> don't have to. Oh, gosh. Oh, Everyone follow Steve Carr. His posts are literally, <laughs> I am high-fiving him every day, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, had, I had to switch social media off for that one. I thought, oh, the backlash on this. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting, though. There, there was different perspectives. So from families, from people that have children go, you know, I don't have children. So they were like, well, one, you don't have children, you know, and most of us don't know that we've got these traumas until we have children. Yeah. Um, okay. And it's right. very evident. It's, it's, it all comes out, whatever you've managed to keep the lid on. I, in my perfect world that I have designed in my head, everyone would do their work, which I'm pretty sure you said in that post before mm. they put the sperm and the egg together, literally mm. do your work before then. If everybody could come and clear their trauma as much as you can because it's I mean I've been clearing my trauma for five and a half years now and it's ongoing and that's okay I could care less I just want rid um yeah it's just then wow a you are going to enjoy your journey so much more mm. and your child is definitely hugely going to benefit from that but if you're there thinking well mine's 16 now good you know cheers Jane it's never too late I, my no. son, what's it? I'm not very good at math, but he's 32. So whatever that is, minus five and a half. That's when I began seriously using the technique that I'm trained in, clearing out my stuff. And mm -hmm. I see, even in an adult, because of our connection, the benefits that's had for him. It's never too late, which is super exciting. And a super great message for everyone. I think we're both saying the same message here, reading off the same page, which was, Yes, it took me 25 years to ask for help. That was because I was conditioned not to. But mm. it was that point, okay, it got to crisis point. But still, nonetheless, I'm here sharing the work that I do to say to people, it's never too late to change. And we all change all of the time. Yeah. Then what you were saying there about therapy, it was everybody benefits from a person in therapy, not just the individual that attends, but everybody that's wrapped around that person. And, you know, if you had known me prior to my breakdown, I was very corporately driven, quite apathetic, quite narcissistic. And it was the corporate, I was towing, towing the corporate mm. line, um, anything to get up the ladder. But, you know, after that breakdown, it was, well, they don't really care too much about me. You need to can start, really start prioritizing your own mental health and well-being, because mm. guess what? Nobody else is. No, it's the truest thing, isn't it? That. Um it's it makes me sad sometimes when I you know I have the best job in the world I get to use this this technique QEC is the technique that I use in my coaching plus plus my ginormous learning about trauma so you know that I always say to people yeah the technique is brilliant created by a medical doctor Dr Manly Salmon but the safety of the person using it is the paramount <laughs> uh, it's otherwise it's like a Ferrari in the hands of a 12 year old um but it's it's the thing of um I've completely forgotten what I was talking about there. I've got no idea. It's gone out of my head. Okay. I'm you know? sure I'll come back. <laughs> um, uh, the safety, the safety of the person. Oh yeah, yeah. You know that you you need to do your work, whether you are a therapist, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a coach, I don't know what else there is digging about in people's stuff. Um, mm. it's really about you doing your own work so that you are the most healthy, healed, whole version of yourself. Otherwise, you're going to do a lot of harm. Yeah. And I, you know, I take what I do as a, I'm so humbled by what people, you know, bring to me. But what I often find is when we first start working together, very stuck in fight flight, which of course they would be. And there's just dr, 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 dr. the need to talk is ginormous. And I have learned that, you know what? They need about an hour. Yeah. They need about yeah. an hour where I'm just, 
making lots of notes because then we're going to create their new subconscious beliefs. But however much I've tried to subvert the system, because I know that just talking is not going to get them the best outcome. It's what they need, but it isn't going to really shift stuff for them. But I've also learned to honor every single person I work with. They need at least an hour where I'm just authentically there. I'm listening. I'm not saying too much. And then we can craft what we need to craft. Um, but it it makes me... Yeah, it breaks my heart sometimes that pretty much none of us have that person unless we we go to a professional. Yeah, absolutely. And many people don't. They don't have that time, but also unable to hold that space for people. Because we yeah. know when we talk about the difficult, challenging stuff, more often than not, it triggers something within somebody else. But True. then there's all the details and they'll go into graphic details, I've noticed. And for somebody that isn't trauma informed, they may even repeat that, which re traumatizes the person yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very difficult space for people to be able to talk if they have, if they're not speaking to a safe person. Yeah. And you don't um, need to go into details. So that's the thing that people no. think that, you know, for me, if you are seeing someone and they are making you talk in detail about, oh, I remember when I was sitting on the chair where block, no, 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 no. That's just re-traumatizing that poor being. There's no amount of money in the universe that you could give me to go back and actually describe. You know, I can see it in my mind as soon as I say, you know, times when I was actively trying to kill myself. There's no amount of, because then I relive it all. Like, why the hell do you want to do that? So sure. as professionals, we yeah. need to be really clear about that. It's not taking people back and making, because literally your whole nervous system will be, you'll feel everything you felt. Oh, and that's 60 minutes. That's the end of our session. Bye-bye. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> now you're in fight, flight, or you're in shutdown or whatever. Yeah. Off you go. It's, uh, yeah, it's about due diligence, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and with the therapist as well, you said something which was really interesting. It's something that my therapist did. I knew for the first two sessions I was talking, which was she needed to grasp a real understanding of what it was that I wanted. Now, eight years down the line and several you know, therapy sessions, hundred therapy sessions later, um, I knew how to get to that point a lot quicker than somebody that didn't know to articulate it. Mm. So for those that are unaware yeah. that they're struggling with their mental health or in fight, flight, freeze, like you say, we'll talk, 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 talk. And it's then for the therapist and it is for them to listen and to make those mental notes. Because if they don't, if they don't have that baseline, how do they know what they're working with? Mm. And, and again, it goes back to the whole coaching industry, doesn't it? That a lot won't do that. And they're there just to take money from these poor, vulnerable people. Yeah. No, it's very, um, I keep very well away from any, <laughs> any, yeah, entity, actually. Yeah, I just say, I, I always get that sense. I feel like, yeah, Steve is in his lane doing his thing. I'm in my lane and, and our lanes, you know, they beautifully flow in and out, but it's yeah. like, I don't yeah. generally connect with other people that define themselves as yeah. coaches or anything. I'm like, mm, I, I've worked and worked and worked to study early childhood trauma you know since I think about 2000 and it was when I was becoming a respite foster carer so 2005 maybe been reading 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 every single day of my life there is never a day I don't read something relating to childhood trauma because I flipping love it mm -hmm. and I don't mean reading people's stories I mean the mechanics of it yeah of course um mm. it's just a joy to me the more I can understand it it's like ah huh, that might be useful to so and so I'm working with oh now I get why da 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 mm -hmm. Um, it makes me a better, I always describe myself as a bit of a mechanic. You know, it's not that I don't love the people I'm working with and bring huge loads of compassion. But for me, it's like getting them the real shifts, mm -hmm. you know, that they des we all deserve to feel safer inside ourselves. Because yeah. from there, everything comes. It's like the most, you know, when you feel safer and more at peace inside, then you start to expand don't you that's what I love yeah and it's such a lovely feeling mm. so at the beginning of this year I wasn't in flow and I felt completely uh, I was detached from myself there was sadly I split with my partner my mm. dad had passed away and I'd moved house all in the space wow. of 
Yeah, absolutely. So I I was completely thrown out there into this void of, oh, what's going on? And wow. quite frankly, I was there. Um, <laughs> completely detached, didn't want to be around people, didn't really know what I was doing, where I was coming from. And the feeling, the feeling was like there was this person sat on my chest that somebody was holding my neck. Yeah. That, permanently wired couldn't sleep properly and I was tense and it just felt like again somebody was trying to crush me that was the feeling mm, gosh. and that was when I invested in therapy but I needed it before that point but mm-hmm. to feel it and then to act on it now gosh I feel so incredibly light so upbeat and this is mm. through therapy now mm-hmm. I think people are scared to attend therapy and go to therapy, one, because, you know, the stigma that's behind therapy, but two, because they're unsure of what it will do. And this is why I'm trying to say to the message to everyone, actually realigns you with who you are and takes you out that flight, fight, freeze mode and actually makes you feel completely different. So it's about the feel it, how you feel. But again, mm. because people have never known the calmness, it can be No, really... I never did. Never no. in life. It's only come in the last few years. I'm like, oh most That's of the time I'm still pretty <laughs> not all the time, but because you're not meant to, your system's shifting, isn't it, all the time. But yeah. like now I can, you know, probably because we're having this amazing, it feels very safe. Mm. And I feel so calm. You know, like when you see the sea and there's not really any waves. So yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah who flipping knew that this land existed what yeah, right? the hell and you cannot get it by being falsely positive or writing down things that you know well I should feel grateful for this I'll write it down and well I did have that lovely you, you did and that's beautiful that you're writing it down but you need to feel it you need yeah. to be back there tune into your heart take a breath and allow the feelings of it to flow through you that's the key it's all Absolutely. about feeling, feeling, feeling. But again, going back to all the you know great points you're making, to get to the point where you feel safe to feel your feelings, you need a somebody that you're working with mm. who is very trauma-informed, very trauma-sensitive, and is not poking about in any of your stuff. Yeah. And that is very hard to find, I, w- I would humbly suggest. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know what you see because you're – more out in the big wide world than me I feel mm. <laughs> or maybe not I don't know it's just my perception um but yeah I again because of people who end up working with me they say mm. oh I work with this person or you know and now I feel worse than ever and and it's because they haven't done what I call due diligence like go study the science behind trauma the neuroscience the neurophysiology the neurobiology the interpersonal neurobiology if you are going to work directly with humans Small yeah. humans, particularly, but all the way along, um, it's an, an imperative. It's not. It's not an add-on. Yeah, uh, and I would absolutely agree with that. If anything, I would say that the coaching industry really does need to work in a partnership with the mental health industry, because we need to have limitations and boundaries. Because mm. a lot of the coaches that that I've seen online really aren't aware of limitations and boundaries within the working environment and people they work with Mm. they might have their own uh, values limitations and boundaries but it's not when they work with people so they're taking on extremely traumatized people and they're trying to use these mindset yeah like rationalizing yeah absolutely yeah yeah Yeah. and it just you know for them again it's a very quick fix takes them into that oh I can't wait for the next session because they made me feel great Mm. going to the gym or gambling having sex or you know all these things that are short-lived and Mm. again you know telling people to suppress their emotions by saying you know the world is great everything is positive yeah just wake up in the morning and tell yourself that you know I mean it's being I know I know because you, you sent me some stuff through and literally I'm like yes 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 the whole way through but how you get to start to be a healthy healing so I don't think there's ever a healed yes. whole human being is that you feel and you're not going to be able to do this on your own or well, I sure as hell have not yeah um you're able to feel all of your emotions mm-hmm. and you are not knocked sideways when you feel sad 
yeah. you're not knocked sideways when you have an understandable moment of loneliness it's very normal you can be in relationships i've been in many relationships and felt very very lonely and alone mm. um not many well quite a few um you know it's that is the key to life the key mm. to life is that humans are meant to be able to feel angry sad lonely contented excited excited used to be a horrible one for me because mm. when we were children if we got excited my parents because you know they were just like ah! mm. so then it feels as an adult it still feels scary so when you get to a place and god it's taken me a lot of work i don't know about you where you can feel all your emotions mm. wow i feel so sad i'm gonna allow myself this car journey where I just feel sad and discombobulated and whatever. And then I'm going to, you know, use the techniques. I have to allow that to gently flow through me in a very natural organic way. And if it comes back later, I'll honor it again. Um, that's, that's healthy. <laughs> this other stuff is, is not healthy. It's not healthy. And, you know, again, I would absolutely agree with that with feeling all of the emotions Coming from a male, again, that wasn't shown these, we only have the two, which is love and anger. Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult to learn all the others. So that's why um, many men, I won't say all men, but uh, certainly a lot of men in my generation really struggled to articulate how they felt because they couldn't explain mm -hmm. how they were feeling. Just simply, they didn't know how. I fear that's changing. And I can see that that is changing. But there is now an issue that comes along with this. So what I'm noticing when I deliver a lot of training is the world has changed and it's more acceptable now to talk about mental health feelings and emotions, especially the younger generation. They've nailed it. So we've said to them, look, this is where we got it wrong. Try this. And they've all gone, well, actually, yeah, I'll talk about my mental health feelings and emotions. The only downfall with this that I can see and that they've experienced is there's nobody there to catch them. Yeah. So meaning our generation have told them what to do but we don't know what to do with it no so true and the reality is that peer-to-peer -peer support is for young people and children is not safe you know i see stuff sometimes on, online it's like oh in our college we do blah blah i'm like so you're getting an immature brain <laughs> to and an immature nervous system to support an immature brain and immature nervous system that's really struggling no that's mm. to me it's not even ethical and it's yeah you yeah that's what I see is that they they and it and it is part of the evolutionary process of of and I don't want to say growing away from the people who raise you because actually you're not you're just being with them differently mm -hmm. um, and then there's this belief that oh they just lean on their peers well they they might do but they still need adults who really check in with them very regularly on an emotional basis their peers are not set to sort this stuff out and yeah. um, all this stuff on social media as well where there's you know you see a lot of celebrities saying oh it's really good to to share what you feel here no it isn't you're sharing into the abyss mm -hmm. and as you and I know I mean you know people sometimes will then attack you or they'll use it in horrible manipulative ways um, so that is a huge culture now, but I don't think it's serving anyone. No. And again, not having those people there to catch them when they do mm -hmm. reach out for help and they say, listen, I'm really struggling with my emotions. OK, we told you to say it, but we don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, we've got a catch 22 going yeah, on. Yeah, that's so fascinating. That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Again, I I spend so much time with my little one and her parents my son and daughter and all they are honestly I have no words but you know it's all emotions based and when when we're like I'm playing with Daisy Dinosaur you know it's like oh how's Daisy Dinosaur feeling oh she's feeling a bit sad oh you know or she's feeling a bit this or a bit angry or a bit everything is emotions 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 and you know if I hadn't gone on this massive learning journey of 32 years um i wouldn't realize that is the bit that matters most you weren't raised with it i wasn't raised with it most people i don't think i've hardly ever met anyone in my entire many years on this planet who can have emotions-based conversations mm. pretty scary really it's very challenging for people especially like when we say this whole conversation really has been around the toxic positivity of what mm. we see people will follow generally what they see online 
and yeah. they don't want to do the work because it is hard work yeah and it challenges them as their whole belief system it challenges mm. them as people and a lot of people won't go down that road because they're comfortable in that pain if yeah. that makes sense yeah it's so, true. yeah it's familiar yeah Absolutely. So it's like, that would mean changing my whole identity. It would mm. mean changing my whole life. My whole belief system will be challenged. Yeah. And that's the challenge. So our job is we're trying to tell people that, you know, what life is different. The other side of this, yes. you may not be able to go back to your job. You may not go back to what you thought you enjoy right now. But on the other side of this is you may have a better job. Your belief system yeah, will be, so be more in alignment and feeling better as a result of the work that you do, as opposed to getting up every day, it being groundhog day and going, why am I alive? Right, let's go. Yeah, I've, I've, had, some, <laughs> I've had people say to me um, on the on the journey, but I but I can't get so much done. Any- no, they don't talk like that anymore because they've been working with me, but they'll say, yeah. the one thing is so that I just cannot, like I used to be able to get up at, 5 30 and do and I just can't do that now no really how's that feeling wow mm. it's a bit annoying sometimes but actually yeah it does it feels so much better no and I do say to people now before I start working I'm like okay so just know that the changes we <laughs> make yeah, it's a yeah. one-way street yeah you not go back through the doors if you then think gosh I actually could and and you know, as you and I know, yeah, you may do more stuff. You don't do it very well. <laughs> uh, mm. If you're doing lots of stuff, you just don't do it. The quality is not there. Um, so you won't be able to go back to that because your system will be upgraded. So you need to be really clear that you mm. do want to fundamentally change for good, because mm. otherwise, exactly what you're saying, you are going to feel so different And your life is going to feel different. You are going to be different. You know, if you have a partner, if you have children at work, everything, you're going to be a much more evolved, calmer, more balanced version of yourself, Mm. which is going to feel weird. You know, it doesn't just happen in one hit, but that's that's where you're headed. So I'm much more now. I set people up really clearly. Yeah. um, You know, if they're disappointed that they haven't got constant adrenaline and cortisol every, you know, anymore, then that's going to be tricky for them. Hey. You know, I think with this stuff, I love meeting people like yourself that act with integrity and have got a good moral compass because we tell people, look, you know, there's risks either side. So it is that risk, if you don't do anything, it will just continue as you are. But the risk is if you do something, it can completely change your life. Yeah. However, it will be for the better. So, you know, you need to balance this up. And I don't know about you, but it's a constant battle in my mind of, actually, I need to earn a living here. <laughs> yeah. I never, you know, I, I, um, I prefer honesty and integrity. And yeah, tell people, too. You know, I, I'd what... rather exactly, that's such an amazing point. I would rather people then choose not to work with me which does happen it happens Mm -hmm. um than i because i have this thing where i only want to earn healthy happy money so money that's gonna sit in my bank account and it's happy to be there yeah you know what is the point that there's no anything i do in life now literally any work i take on at or literally anything i do but particularly work related I I honestly I would rather eat stale bread every day, which I have done in the past, um, mm-hmm. than take money from someone who it comes with resentment or this isn't really working for them. It's no. Yeah. I'm with you on that as well, Jane. And I think, you know, if you have to tell somebody, well, you have to remortgage your house or put it on your credit card, mm. I think you've got very little, you know, do, you're not working ethically there. And if anybody has gone through that, if anybody is listening to this, has experienced that, just know this, that that is toxic. And that mm-hmm. really is, it's more damaging than, you know, than what it is positive. And it's only mm-hmm. Very rarely does it result in a good outcome and you'll continually be feeding into it. So if you do it right the first time, okay, there may be more cost to it. But like anything in life, you know, the the more you pay for something, the better value you're going to get within it. So it's I know it can be scary for people as well around, you know, as we're talking about money. Um, Therapy Mm -hmm. doesn't need to be expensive. But again, you know, it's subjective, isn't it? For some, it might be well, that's cheap, and for others, it could exactly, be exactly, yeah. And I and I 
yeah it's interesting because i'm i'm definitely not a therapist i don't charge therapy rates mm. um but i know that i'm very comfortable with what i charge because i yeah. know that you are definitely going to get fundamental lasting change when you work with me mm. and you're going to spend a lot of money with other people maybe smaller amounts but you're going to be with them for years and years working on the same stuff so sometimes people stay with me for years but because they clear that out and then they're like flipping it what can I get rid of now <laughs> you're in the biggest <laughs> sweet store candy store of your life and you can have what the hell you want yeah of what you want I, I always say to people you can leave your bag of rubbish at the door and then you can come in the store and you can just have what you want and we will clear it out what's blocking it and we'll create it and we'll put it in and you know there might be a couple of tweaks because stuff is complicated and we don't know ourselves very well but you'll mm. get it you know if you yeah. to feel more just kind of okay with yourself again you know going back to the false positivity i am more than good enough i accept myself on every blah 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 well unless you do that subconsciously then you'd be repeating that forever more you know <laughs> you get up every morning look in the bloody mirror and saying i am good and like literally cannot be bothered personally you'd rather make a cup of tea um but you know if you want to install it deeply in your system and then it just radiates out and it's how you feel yeah. Um, you know, I wake up every day and I don't have an opinion on, you know, like that stuff. I don't need to remind myself because it's just in me now. I don't yeah. need to say it. I don't need to write it down. Mm. Um, another thing I know we need to wind this up because literally you and I probably be here for three days. Oh, we could. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. you know, like Self-love. That's another thing that I really struggle with because I feel like I don't I don't not love myself when I don't love myself. Yeah. Just at peace yeah I just yeah. have this inner acceptance of you know if I stuff up then I'm like oh I might have a moment of discomfort where I wish I hadn't said that thing in that way or you know whatever it is it's very rare but it does happen but it goes so quickly mm. I didn't not love myself in that moment I don't love myself now I'm just back to feeling inner peace and just acceptance of whatever this is which is really just atoms I like just being atoms at this point in my life. <laughs> I'm just like, you cannot take this too seriously. It's just a load of atoms walking around. Yeah. FYI. <laughs> but to, to um, end this conversation, I don't actually want to end. Um, mm. What would, from this, you know, your journey, we've only touched on it, but your journey is one of, I find it very humbling when I read your posts about, everything and I know it's only like a top line of what you've been through and what you've where you've come I don't even know through it is the right term but it's but what would you want people you're, you're in a lift with someone and you can just impart very succinctly which is not my thing <laughs> and one thing about the possibility of where you can be and where you can arrive and you know as you and I know it's ongoing like I will never stop working on myself there's something yeah. about I don't know mental health whatever you would your Steve Carr message to the universe no pressure <laughs> my Steve Carr message to the universe would be remember asking for help isn't about giving up it's about mm -hmm. not giving up oh, so I that would that. just be summarizing this but it, it's telling people that Recovery is likely impossible and that there are people out there ready to listen. There are safe spaces. It's finding those safe people, finding those safe spaces. And once you do find them, once they accept you for who they are, you'll notice this journey that you can go on of acceptance. When people accept you, you can be who you want to be. Recovery is likely and it is possible. There's a reason why I don't say it is, you know, it's 100%. You will recover because that's again it's one of those false narratives yeah. because not everybody will so what i say is recovery is likely impossible and remember asking for help isn't about giving up it's about oh. not giving up you have to get that for a tattoo i think so you've got a few more than me <laughs> i quite, <laughs> I quite often say to myself oh up. i need to get that tattooed up my arm and like, i have space i'm not so sure about you but... <laughs> no it's, it's it's narrowing down but i do have that in fact i've put that slogan onto the back of um my uh onto the uh, my um uh i forget the name of the word what's the name of the merchandise sorry so mine can you merchandise so if you want to see it that was what mine... i 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's lots of words there. Um, oh, so, yeah, mindcanyon.co.uk, you'll see all about my courses there and my uh, merchandise. And, uh, yeah, all about my story. And um, yes. yeah. Please do. I will um, put Steve's, everything I can find where you can follow Steve. I would really recommend, honestly, his posts on link i think you do linkedin and facebook particularly i see your posts and they make you in a really brilliant way they make you just pause and think and even if you think well i don't know if i you know i'm sure people don't agree with half of what i post i'm not there i am just there to show what i absolutely know and i know steve it, this is why we connect so well like you know you know it's true because you're living it mm -hmm. you're living it you're not yeah. saying it for any other reason. I don't, nothing do I post. I mean, I I should be better at the, what is it, call for action. And people are always telling me, but you never do a thing where people are going, I'm like, no, but I just want to post the post, all right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just want people to know that this is a real thing and, you yeah. know, not not to, yeah. So I I am so delighted to have this time with you, Steve. I'm very excited for what's coming for you next and um you know all your insights all your wisdom it's just been a complete joy the whole of it and i look yeah. forward to seeing your pictures when you're back in thailand and... yes not long now and um, thank you so much thank you for having me on and um thank you for your time as well i love, love this conversation oh thank take you. care bye bye thanks jane